welcome OCAM students. The purpose of today's uh, demonstration is to show you how to assemble these parts and pieces to accomplish a simple distillation. But before we get to the nuts and bolts, I want to talk a little bit about what a distillation is and what it is not. And what it is not is a chemical reaction. We are heating a mixture of materials, but there should not be a chemical reaction occurring a distillation is a physical separation method, a method that is commonly used to separate and purify liquids. Uh, I, we use distillation to separate liquids based on differences in their boiling point or their volatility. And in the case that we're going to do today, a simple distillation, uh, we can use it to separate a volatile liquid from a non-volatile solid. And an example in real life might be the separation of pure water from seawater. Uh, the salt is non-volatile, it'll remain behind and you would distill off water that you could drink. Uh, we use simple distillation to separate volatile liquids whose boiling points differ from each other by at least 25 degrees. Our textbook says, I believe, 40 to 50 degrees. We'll do uh, a different type of distillation to separate closely boiling liquids. Today's Distillation will be the simple distillation of non-volatile solid separated from a volatile liquid. So this is all the equipment you're going to use. You'll need a stirring hot plate and uh, our sand bath. This, in our experiment, it, they want us to distill out of a 25 milliliter round bottom flask. And you always, always, always put in a magnetic stir bar. We never boil anything without a magnetic stir bar in it. This is the condenser adapter. It will fit onto the top of the flask. Here's one of the metal keck clips. It's used to secure the joint so this thing doesn't come apart. In the top of the condenser adapter, you'll use this uh, Teflon thermometer adapter, and it has a black O-ring on it. That O-ring needs to be seated into the glass, down into the glass, so the rubber makes a very tight seal with the glass. If it's not tight, then guess what happens? The volatile vapors just leave out the top and uh, you end up with nothing in the still pot and, and you've, you've breathed in half of the compound. So make sure that this is tight. When that O-ring is sealed, you don't need a keck clip on that joint. Here's the water jacketed condenser we're gonna use. I'm gonna put it on at an angle or these inlet and outlet at an angle. You'll see why in a minute. I'll secure this joint with another Keck clip. I think at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and fasten this onto the uh, upright, and I'm using one of these small cl uh, clamps. They work a little better, I think, than the larger clamps. They can get a nice grip around the neck of this flask. So I'm gonna set that in there for a minute. Set this up. Hi, Jerry. Can you see that? What I want is this clamp to be down around the neck of the flask. So I'm trying to drop that down there. Now, I'm not sure if the camera can pick this up, but, but what I have done is I've taken that round bottom flask, and I'm gonna use this as a, maybe you can see this a little better. Here's another sand bath and another round bottom flask. The flask needs to go down all the way in the bottom of the sand, all the way. It doesn't sit on the top of the sand. This is poor heat transfer. We'll be here all day waiting for your stuff to boil because you're only heating the very bottom of the flask. This guy needs to go down into the sand so we have maximum heat transfer to the walls of the flask. We're gonna use this larger flask uh, to, to collect the, uh, the distillate. The distillate's what you call the, the liquid that you condense over. This adapter with the, with the uh, a hose connection on the side is called a vacuum adapter and you would use it for vacuum distillation. You would connect a vacuum hose there. In our case, it serves as an outlet to the atmosphere so that, so that this system 
is vented to the atmosphere. We never heat a closed system because it could explode. So here's our atmospheric vent. As long as we have that adapter, no problem. We'll put the collection flask here, secure it with another Keck clip. So you notice all of these joints were secured by Keck clips except for the thermometer adapter. Now here's a little lab jack and these are in the drawers with the hot plates. We use the lab jack to support this flask. This, this will get heavy. We don't want this whole thing leveraged out here and tipping over. Ideally, we want this, this part of the distillation column to be vertical. To give it additional support and to make sure that it is vertical, I'm using a second clamp that's going to go on the adapter right below where this connection is with the thermometer adapter. So when I do that, now, now this piece is vertical. You notice this is at an angle, it's not horizontal. It's at a slight angle. And we are about set. Uh, a couple of things we have to do. Well, we're going to put the thermometer in. When you take off this yellow knob, there should be a black O-ring inside. The black O-ring is necessary to make a tight seal. So make sure your adapter has that O-ring. That'll go back on there. Now, I hope you can see where I'm going to position the thermometer bulb. The th Here's the condenser outlet. And maybe the angle's not good. Let me turn. Maybe you can see better now. Here's the condenser outlet. That thermometer bulb needs to be just slightly below where that, or maybe the top of the blue part of the bulb, right there at the exit to the condenser. If the thermometer is placed too low, you read a temperature that's artificially high. If the thermometer goes too high, you read a temperature that's artificially low. The perfect boiling point measurement will be made with the thermometer bulb right at the entrance to the condenser. So once that's properly placed, then screw this yellow knob down until, this, until it goes snug and that O-ring will hold that thermometer there and it won't move. I can't slide it up and down now. And also, the vapors can't escape around that, around that opening. The only other thing we need to do now is connect the water hoses. So put this one on the, this, the lower one will be the water inlet. Here's why. I want this condenser to fill by gravity. I mean, understand it's under water pressure and the water pressure will fill it. But if the water pressure drops, then, then uh, if we were coming in the top, then the water would just roll along the bottom of the condenser and out and it wouldn't in case the inner tube. Whereas if we go from the bottom, even if we have a loss of water pressure, it will still by gravity be pushing the water out the top. So the inner jacket stays, stays uh, covered in water. So there's the inlet. Uh, this shouldn't be a problem for anybody because there's, there's only a DI water outlet on the end of the bench. So nobody should be connecting their condenser to the DI water outlet. You'll use these right here at the sink. All right, this goes on the outlet. Make sure it's in the sink. All right, and now we have the water hoses connected and I'll, sh I'll show you why I wanted these hoses off at an angle or why the condenser inlet and outlet, I put it at an angle. I'm gonna center the hot plate because I'd like to have this stir bar right under the magnet in the center of the hot plate. If it's off to the side, then the stir bar doesn't stir properly. But if I center it now, we should get nice stirring. If I had these hoses turned like this so that they're vertical, then look what happens. At least one of these hoses lays up against the hot plate. This surface gets hot. This is rubber, the rubber melts, and you take a shower, or you or, or a classmate takes a shower. If it happens to somebody else, it's pretty funny. If it happens to you, it's not so funny. So to avoid that embarrassment, we turn this at a slight angle, and then that'll keep the hose from touching the surface of the hot plate. So that's a, that's a little tip I learned the hard way. 
All right, I think we've got everything all set up. What we need, the only thing we're missing now are the two materials that we're going to separate. So I wanted to get this all set up and then we'll add the material. Well, I've disassembled the apparatus momentarily because I didn't add the chemicals initially. I wanted to show you how to put up the apparatus first. You can get it set up and then do what I did and take it apart and then add the chemicals. Or if you're a black belt, you can put the chemicals in first and then do the assembly, uh, confident that you're not going to tip it over and sp spill it. Our non-volatile material is, is called ferrocene, and it's an organometallic compound, and the only reason we're using it today is because in the, in the liquid, it's going to give a yellow color. I'm going to add a very small amount, of, maybe you can see that against the contrast of the white top. It's a very small amount, just put a little in the, into the flask. I'm not, not weighing that out, it's just to give it some color. Uh, in our distillation, we're using 10 milliliters of cyclohexane. So I'm going to go ahead and add the 10 mils. I'll stir that up for a second. Um, let me pull this flask out for a minute because just to demonstrate that, that the solution did turn yellow. I think you can see the... the Solid has dissolved and the solution's yellow. So the idea here is we have a yellow impurity, essentially non-volatile impurity. Notice when I put that back in that I set that flask way down in the sand again. And now this should all go back together. Should go back together. Here we go. All right, now we are locked and loaded, as they say. We are ready to go. I'm going to turn the cooling water on, and in this laboratory, the cooling water is almost digital. It's like all the way on or all the way off, so you have to be very careful, or again, you or a neighbor is going to take a shower. So I'm going to turn this slowly, and you'll, you'll be able to hear it probably, or or sense that it's when it eventually starts to go into the hose. Here we go. I know my arms in the way you couldn't see that, but we now have water flowing through the condenser. What's the right amount of water? We don't we don't need to uh, it does, we don't need to have too much. We're not trying to. Um, create Niagara, Niagara Falls here, 30 people running multi-gallons multi a minute of water, but something like that is a good flow. Make sure the hose goes into the sink and make sure the hose is long enough to go into the sink or you will have water all over the bench. Cooling water, stir bar, we are ready to go. Turn on the stir, turn on the heat, and uh, of course what has to happen now is the hot plate gets hot first, it heats the crucible, the crucible heats the sand, the sand heats the glass, the glass heats the liquid, and eventually we get a distillation going, but that's not an instantaneous process. It will take 10 or 15 minutes before we get boiling. You will see boiling in the liquid before you ever see it on the thermometer. You won't get the temperature rise until the vapors hit the thermometer bulb, and that will be another few minutes once the boiling has started here. So at this point, we're ready to go. Uh, temperature now is reading 20, about 24 degrees C. So we're just gonna wait a few minutes and we'll come back and visit this again when the distillation is underway. About 10 minutes have gone by and we're back at the distillation. The distillation has started now and there are two things I wanna call your attention to. We are distilling. You can see we're collecting at a pretty good rate. Uh, I turned the heat up pretty, uh, pretty high initially to get this going. Um, in this kind of a distillation, we're probably all right with this kind of a rate. 
if we were trying to separate two volatile components, you'd want to have this drip rate a lot slower, probably about a drip every one to two seconds. Uh, this is probably going two drips a second. It's a little fast. Now, the other thing I wanted to call your attention to is the thermometer. The temperature will not rise in the thermometer until the hot vapors hit the bulb, and then it will shoot up rapidly. And now it's plateaued at about, uh, about 78 degrees. Well, I backed off on the heat a little bit, and I slowed down the distillation rate, and now we're getting a drip, uh, a, a drip every couple of seconds. And I'm looking in the, in the still pot, and there's just a little bit of the liquid left. We started with 10 milliliters, and probably right now we have seven or eight milliliters in the, in the collection flask. So at this point, you want to keep an eye on the still pot because you don't want to take this to dryness. You never want to take a distillation to dryness. Uh, if nothing else, the f an empty flask can crack under the heat. So what I'm going to do now, it's, it's, getting, it's getting down pretty close to the end. So I'm going to, I'm going to lift this up out of the heat. And we're going to call it a day for this distillation. And if you can, take a, look at the, take a look at the amount of material that, was, that I left in the flask. I probably left about a milliliter, maybe two. So we started with 10 milliliters. We don't expect or want or desire to get 10 milliliters back. Uh, the recovery is not going to be 100%, and that's intentional. Well, our distillation is over. I want to just go over a couple of uh, important points that uh, I need you to remember. One of them is when you, every time you do a distillation, you must use a magnetic stir bar. Don't let me catch you doing a distillation without a magnetic stir bar. The liquid will do what's called bump, which means boil violently and it'll shoot up the tube and then you're not really accomplishing a separation. In this case, this yellow material that we put in would be physically carried over into the column and you wouldn't have accomplished a separation. So uh, bumping is violent boiling and it can be prevented by the use of a magnetic stir bar. So always use a magnetic stir bar and use the one that's the appropriate size for the experiment. We have two magnetic stir bars, large and small. So if, if we're just stirring a liquid and it's a small amount, we'll use the small one. Anytime you're going to have to stir a solid and dissolve the solid, it's a bit good idea to use the larger one. Now we use the Keck clips to seal all of the joints. But before you start the distillation, you should go back when the, all, the entire apparatus is assembled and twist these joints to make sure that they're snug. Because sometimes you have the feeling that the Keck clip is holding the system together, but the joint has worked itself loose as you've put other pieces of equipment on the, on the system. So if there is a loose joint, the vapor's coming out there. And uh, so you'll end up breathing it or you just won't collect anything over in the distillation flask. Uh, when you set up the cooling water from the tap, the outlet goes into the sink. And that seems obvious, but we had one fellow one year who decided to put the outlet of the condenser into the vacuum. Don't do that. It goes into the sink. I recommend that you turn your condenser so the hose, con hose connections are a little horizontal and that'll keep the, that'll keep the uh, tube off of the hot plate. You always want to use the lab jack to support the collection flask. Be mindful of the thermometer position. If the thermometer bulb is too low, you read a temperature that's artificially high. If you, re if you position the bulb too high, the temperature you read is artificially low. The temperature in the distillation, will not, you won't see a temperature rise on the thermometer until the vapors reach the bulb. So you can see boiling in the pot without a temperature rise. So just be patient and you should be able to watch the vapor climb up the adapter and touch the thermometer bulb. Another thing is when you're distilling small amounts of material, the temperature that you read on the thermometer may never get to the 
uh, literature boiling point of the material that we're distilling. And that's just uh, the fact that happens when you're doing small amounts of material or the other time it doesn't reach uh, the proper boiling point is if it's a very high boiling material, we often find that the thermometer doesn't, doesn't get to the uh, literature boiling point. So uh, just be aware that that might happen. Don't distill to dryness. You want to leave the impurities behind. If you have a residue in here and, and you continue to heat it, it may thermally decompose and bring bad things over into the distillate. And also the flask might crack. In this experiment, we separated a non-volatile yellow solid from a volatile liquid, and I think you can see we were successful in getting the pure cyclohexane off of the uh, cyclohexane fer ferrocene mix. The last thing I'd say is when you go to disassemble this setup, just be careful because the glass is hot. And so the most common accident in the OCHEM lab is a burn. So be very careful. When you're done with the distillation and you turn the heat off, this thing does not cool down instantaneously. There's a lot of heat retained. And so when you're ready to stop the distillation, turning the heat off doesn't stop it. What you have to do is physically uh, remove the flask from the hot sand. You have to lift this apparatus up and out. Otherwise, it's going to continue to boil. So that's very important. Doing this just makes you feel good, but it didn't really accomplish anything. There's plenty of heat left in that sand to boil the rest of that liquid over and take the flask to dryness, so be careful about that. Those are all the tips I can think of for distillation, and uh, good luck. I'll be watching you when you do yours.